بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته I start most of my talks with this card. This card was given to me by my daughter, Sara. Every morning, I wake up and go by this card. It says, I love you, so be happy. And so every morning, I take a conscious decision that I'm going to be happy regardless what happens to me. And I ask every one of you to take that kind of decision every morning when you wake up, that you're going to be happy regardless what happens to you. Every morning, um, we wake up, we go to, we eat, we drink, uh, we go to work, and we go back and sleep. And the cycle goes on and on. Then, one day, suddenly, we wake up and ask, why are we alive? Why am I here? What's the purpose of my existence? And if we look deep into ourselves, we can answer that question and say, we are here so that humans can live in harmony together on this earth. And then you ask yourself, so what can I do to help bring harmony to this world? If you look around you, you can find a problem that actually uh, bothers you, that you're passionate about. You can think up of a solution and go and do something about it, take action. I'm going to share with you uh, what happened when I woke up one morning and asked that very same question. Why am I alive? What's the purpose of my existence? What can I do to make a difference? It's the story of We Love Reading. نَحْنُ نُحِبُّ الْقِرَاءَ When I was studying for my PhD on a Fulbright grant in the United States, I spent most of my evenings with my mice in the lab because I'm a molecular biologist. While my children, I have four, would spend all their evenings at the public library. In the States, in every neighborhood, there's a public library. Uh, my children would participate in every activity available, whether it was reading aloud, or puppet shows, or volunteer activities. When we came back to Jordan, um, I looked around to find libraries for my children. Unfortunately, there were no libraries. Um, and those that were around closed very early. There were no librarians, there were no activities. I solved my children's uh, problem. I bought them books and I read books to them. But we realized that there's a problem in Jordan. The problem was children don't read. And for that matter, even adults don't read. And when I say read, I'm not talking about reading for education, which most Jordanians go to school, most of them go to the university. I'm talking about reading for pleasure. And what I define reading for pleasure is when you're at 12 o'clock at night, standing at the traffic lights, and my daughter says, Mother, can I open the light so I can go on and see what happened to my story? That's reading for pleasure. So, and why do we think reading is important? I could go on and on talking about the benefits of reading. It increases the imagination, it broadens the horizons of these children, it takes them beyond time and distance to learn about other people's experiences, and it develops them into becoming responsible citizens who can make a difference in their country. So we wanted to find out why, and as a scientist, I had to do some research. Uh, so I looked around and for a solution, and the solution was uh, trying to find out why do children don't read and how we can make them to read. So I asked the experts, which are the students, the children themselves, why don't you read? And they gave me a variety of responses from adults don't read to us, we don't have role models, there's not enough books and so on. And when I asked them what they think the solution was, they answered that we need people to read uh, for us, it has to be fun, so we realized through this research that the reason children don't read is not for lack of books, as most people think. It's for lack of the experience of being read to. It's like the Chinese proverb, you don't, teach, you don't give someone a fish, you teach them how to fish. So now that we knew the solution, uh, we had to do something. Now, I'm not rich, and I don't know anyone in the government to go start uh, uh, programs for read aloud in schools uh, in the kingdom. However, uh, I know uh, that I can make a difference. Uh, and the Rasul taught us, Kullukum ra'in wa kullukum mas'ulun an ra'iyatih. So I had to do something. And knowledge is responsibility. Uh, and I thought, I'm not going to wait for someone to do it. I'm not going to blame anyone. Why aren't they doing it? I'm going to be the change I want to see in the world, as Gandhi said. 
So I looked around me and I started thinking of a way with my family, my children are my inspiration, how we can start read aloud sessions in Jordan in our neighborhood. Now, a lot of people told me, are you crazy? This is impossible. There's no way you can change children overnight to become readers. And I remembered a quote I saw on the wall on Adidas, which says, impossible is nothing. Impossible is a word thrown around by small men who, had who find it easier to live in a world they begin in uh, than to explore the power they have to change it. Impossible is not a fact. Impossible is an opinion. It's your opinion that it's impossible. I don't think it's impossible. Impossible is a dare. It's a challenge. It's a potential. In the end, impossible is nothing. And the road of a, uh, that starts of a thousand miles starts with the first step. So I was going to do the first step. I wanted to read uh, in my neighborhood. I looked around me. Where can I read? I could use my house, but my house is not going to go on forever, and not everybody is going to send their children to my house. So I thought, I looked around me, and what is in every neighborhood in Jordan and the Arab world? There's a mosque. So I th why don't we use the mosque? It's in every neighborhood, regardless of the socioeconomic status. It's clean, it has a carpet, it has a bathroom, because we're talking about children. It's a perfect place. It's like, just like the public library in the States. So I went to the, my neighborhood, to the mosque, and I told them I want to start reading aloud to children on Saturday morning. And we used the Friday pairs to announce that we're going to have a read aloud session. Uh, the people in the mosque were very responsive. Uh, they announced in the Friday prayers that there's going to be a read aloud. And we chose the age of the children to be between four and ten. Because if we go below four, you have to involve the parents. So forget about it. We're not going to convince the parents. And if you go above ten, it's a whole different type of books. And research has proven that it's easier to plant the love of reading when the child is younger. And in the mosque, you can put boys and girls together between four and ten. So the first time, uh, in 2006, 25 children showed up on Saturday morning. Of course, they came. <laughs> they came because their parents dragged them. You know parents. Wherever there's an activity, they take their children, even if they don't like it. Uh, but after two weeks, in the next session, the children were waking up early in the morning and dragging their parents that we wanted to go to the mosque to listen to the stories. When I... <laughs> Uh, when I, what I do in one hour, I put on my hat and I have a whole packet of uh, puppets and I read two to three stories in this hour. Of course, the type of stories I, I choose are books that have very good language in Arabic because if you're going to read for pleasure, it has to be in your native tongue. Uh, these books are attractive, they have nice pictures, and they relate to the everyday uh, activities of a child. He, can, he or she can see themselves in the book. After the hour, the, the children actually take the books home because so they could relive the experience of being read to in their own house. And that's the key to planting the love of reading. And then every two weeks, they come back and we exchange the books. Now, we have succeeded in planting the love of reading in these children. And I measure that when these children line up to take their books, they recommend books to each other. They know the names of authors. I challenge adults in this room uh, if they know the names of authors. And one girl, when she's lining up and her book is at the end of the pile, she'll tell me, keep that book till the end so when it's my turn, I can take that book. This proves that children are children wherever they are in the world. They just have to get the right experience to bring out their potential. And, uh, uh, and the... <laughs> So through this uh, library, as I define it, which is a, a place, a public place where we can read aloud to children, uh, we can change the, the statistics. Statistics has shown that reading in the Middle East is, amounts to half a page a year, while in the States it's 11 books a year. So we want to change that trend and, and, uh, and make them read more. So my, my daughters made a website and a logo for our project. Our, our mission is to have a library in every neighborhood, not just in Jordan, but in the Middle East and in the world. Now, we stopped at this point for three years. Every time I'd go to someone and tell them, why don't you start a library in your neighborhood? It takes you only two hours a month, which is nothing compared to the benefits reaped. And they'd say, no, I, I, you know, they'd feel shy. They're not used to volunteer work. They're not used to reading aloud. Until uh, Synergos, which is an uh, American-based institution, 
that uh, ha fights injustice in the world, they developed a new program called the Arab World Social Innovator Award. So I applied and I won the grant. Now, they gave me... Um, I, they gave me $34,000 for my project. That was great, but the real award was the, uh, the credibility for giving me recognition. Now everybody else was listening. Before, I'd tell them about my project, and everybody would say, yes, Rana, very good, and, and that was it. Now, everybody was opening the doors. What can we do for you? So that was fine, but this is human nature. Humans always don't buy into an idea until someone else does the buying, and then you're fine. So we started training ladies. Of course, we uh, advertised our training to everybody, males and females, but mostly it was ladies who, who came and volunteered, which is great. Uh, we trained them how to read aloud, and we have a professional trainer, and we also trained them on the model of Wheel of Reading, which is starting a library in the ladies' neighborhood. And this is about woman empowerment, because this is her own library. She takes care of it from all t uh, aspects, from financially, the children, and the books. And, and also, these, these platforms give women empowerment, they give sus sustainability to the project, which is the mo most of the problems with volunteer work, and most importantly, it brings the community together because it's in the community, it's grassroots. And when we train these ladies, we tell them, we're training you for free. We don't want you to pay it back, we want you to pay it forward, if you've seen the movie. So we tell them, if I train you, you train someone else, and you tell that person you have to train someone else, and so on. And, and so the idea will spread, hopefully, all throughout the world. Uh, we also use these uh, libraries as platforms for dissemination of information and awareness programs. One of the most important problems with any project that wants to raise awareness is how to get to the grassroots. So through these libraries, anybody could start um, uh, raising awareness uh, among the neighborhoods. Also, these libraries are not just for read aloud, they're for doing activities in the community, such as cleaning up the neighborhood if you're reading a book about uh, cleaning up. Or in 2008, when the Gaza war happened, a lot of children were traumatized by the pictures they saw on TV. So we gave them uh, huge pieces of paper to, uh, to paint a message to the children of Gaza to relieve the trauma that they were feeling uh, watching what was going on on TV. And in 2009, I, we were nominated for the, two, for the uh, la final 30 for Ahli al which is an award by Queen Rania for community service. And we... Uh, this is slow. And we, were, uh, we started training. Up till now, we've trained 420... Uh, sorry, we've trained 420 ladies. I think five of them are males, which is fine. And uh, we have 100 libraries now in different areas of Jordan, in Ghor, in Madaba, in uh, Salt, in Mafra, uh, in, uh, uh, in Shun al-Shamaliyya. Uh, and as I said, these are platforms for awareness. And in Zarqa as well. We've also, the idea has spread to Lebanon, United Arab Emirates, Tunis. Uh, Turkey, we had two ladies coming from the Arab, uh, the Mother-Child mother Foundation to train on our model so they could implement it in Istanbul. And we have uh, a lady, her name is Jihad, she's going to Malaysia and she's going to start a library in Malaysia, inshallah. <laughs> We've established an NGO which we call Change. Uh, we had our first conference in summer 2010. Uh, we uh, partnered with many local and international institutions and we were invited to the Clinton Global Initiative in 2010 and we committed we committed to open a hundred libraries in the next five years and we calculated it cost less than fifty dollars to actually make a child read forever so uh, I like to share with you a song that I feel puts into song, uh, into words, my experience. And the song, it's an old song, I don't know if you're familiar with it. It says, the higher you climb, the more that you see. The more that you see, the less you know. The less you know, the more that you yearn. And the more that you yearn, the higher you climb. So... So this led me to more inspirations. And I'm going to share another short story about waking up in the morning again and asking, why am I here?
What's the purpose of my existence? I don't know how, if we have physicists in the audience, but I'm sure many of you are familiar with the chaos theory, which says that if a butterfly flutters its wings in, the, in China, there's an, a hurricane in the Atlantic. And this reminds me of Hadith Rasulullah uh, So from this, when I came back from the States to teach at the Hashemite University, uh, I came with the idea that education is not the filling of a pail, but the lighting of a fire, as William Yeats put it so nicely. And instead of, I found out that instead of our universities producing students, uh, they were producing students who were a burden on the community, who were not responsible, who didn't make a difference. Rather than, as most universities say that their mission is, is to produce students who have a huge imagination, creative, and can make a difference in their communities. So looking around for a different kind of pedagogy uh, to change the method of instruction, I found service learning. Now, I don't know if you're familiar with service learning, but service learning is a method of instruction whereby you change the student, instead of being bored in the classroom, listening to you lecturing all day, you change him for him or her to become the teacher, to go out into the community and teach the community what they should have been taught in the classroom. So they are learning because it's the teacher who learns a lot more than the student because you have to prepare. And the community is benefiting from the information the student is giving. So it's a perfect uh, scenario, a perfect balance. Now when I went, I'm going to take off this because that story is done. When I went to the university officials and told them, why don't we start implementing service learning at the university? They looked at me and they said, there's no need, and it was a negative response. Did I take no for an answer? Of course not. <laughs> so I thought, Knowledge is responsibility. You be the change you want to see in the world. Nothing is impossible. It's the first step that matters. So what I did is I made a team from the professors at the university, and we started implementing service learning at the university, and we did a pilot run, and we proved that this is a better method, and our students were doing a lot better. Then, I know money talks, that's not enough. So I emailed over 100 different service learning centers, first in the States, and then in Europe. And finally, somebody answered my response. It was the University of Roehampton in England. And they said, we'll help you, we'll be partners with you. And we found out that Tempest, which is an EU institution, uh, which gives grants to projects like that. So after a year of uh, writing the proposal with England, uh, we never talked on the phone. David Woodman, the director, said in an email, Rana, can I call you? And I thought, uh-oh, he wants to make sure I'm real, that I'm not, you know, just a, it's not a machine-generated um, email. So he called me up and said, hello, Rana. And I said, hi, no, I'm real, I exist <laughs> uh, in Jordan. And we applied in 2008 uh, to Tempest. We didn't get the grant. Did that make us stop? No. We went around, we got more uh, partners from locally from Jordan, regionally from Lebanon, and internationally. And we applied again in 2009 with the teamwork. We did get the grant, which was around a million euros, which was divided between our different universities. So, in 2010, we were on the cliffs of Ireland, overlooking the Atlantic, taking service learning courses, 30 professors from the region. So, when a butterfly fluttered its wings in the Hashemite University, we didn't get a hurricane, we got a rainbow. We got a service learning center at the Hashemite University. So, I want to... Uh, end this story with this poem, which is written by an Indian poet in the 10th century, which says, fire can burn but cannot move. Wind can move but cannot burn. Till fire joins wind, it cannot take a step. Do men know it's like that with knowing and doing? That reminds me of a hadith of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi So. To conclude, Everyone is special. Everyone is unique. I ask every one of you to look inside themselves. Believe in yourself. Find something you're passionate about and go do something about it. Because the greatest happiness you can 
have is feeling that you've achieved something. And the greatest achievement is helping someone else. And will you succeed? I read uh, where the places you'll go by Dr. Seuss every night to my children. 98, three quarter percent guaranteed. Kid, you'll move mountains. So to end, I remind you of, of two sayings, one by Jane Fonda. She says, uh, I challenge every man and woman in this room and in the world to be a volcano to make a difference. And Bob Kennedy said once, let's join forces to make a wall that crushes injustice. Finally, I'm going to show you this movie that puts my words into action, and I hope you'll like it. Thank you very much. So don't wait. Go out and make a difference now. Thank you very much. Thank you.